What's up, everybody? How y'all doing? It's a good weekend, isn't it? Because you know why? Football's back. Anybody excited about that? Yeah? Watching some football yesterday, it was like everything is becoming right in the universe again. You know, when you got some the game on. And I'm starting to indoctrinate my little three-and-a-half-year-old. I actually took her to a little high school football Friday night, you know, and the girl loved it. We're on the right path, people. We're on the right path. Anyways, hey, we're so glad that you're here with us. Welcome today. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us online. We're doing this awesome series right now called Whatever It Takes, where we've been talking about our different values as a church and how we can learn from these and as a people together come and apply them into our lives and even apply them corporately. And today, we're talking about a value uh, where we say we live character-driven, character-driven. Let me just read this to you about this value, that we never compromise integrity for the sake of progress, that we are imperfect people striving to model the character of Jesus. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit today. Before we jump in and get rolling here, I want to stop and just have a little disclaimer, okay? And it's a disclaimer for this message, and it's this, that if I say anything dumb, incoherent or that doesn't make sense it could be due to sleep deprivation i'm, I'm serious y'all because if you don't know this my wife gave birth to our third kid just under four weeks ago so um yes very excited for that and if you ever have brought a kid home like this look at that stud stud we got the next one shows his personality right here check this out I don't know where he gets that from. This is when I took the older kids out to go get frozen yogurt, and my wife texted me this picture. I think he was a little upset about that one. But um, cute little kid. His name is Andrew Gregory Hibiski, and uh, we've got a couple, another picture here. And he's got two older sisters who are absolutely loving having a baby brother. Um, they have been caring for him. So we have a three-and-a-half-year-old, a, a two-year-old, and a brand-new. Y'all can pray for us because <laughs> it is crazy, and there's not a whole lot of sleep happening up in that house. Um, but Andrew Gregory Hibiski, born August 10th, uh, just, so just a few weeks ago, 21 inches long, and get this, 10 pounds, 7 ounces. Man child. Man child, y'all. Um, but he's doing really good. Mom is doing good. We're adjusting into a, a life with a family of three and the newborn and craziness. So Seriously, if I say anything dumb, I'm pulling out the baby card. I've been riding the baby card. You know, it's like, sorry, I can't get that project done. Baby card. You know, it's working out pretty good for me. But hey, we're so glad you're here as we get talking through this. And as we think about this idea of being character driven, uh, I think back to this, even with my son Drew right now, that in the beginning of his life, and for all of us from birth, our lives are moving towards a destination. It's like we're moving along this path in our life. And along this path for our life, we will make many different decisions, many different choices that will impact the destination for our life. They'll impact the path that we walk on. And many of these decisions will impact our character. And we'll have a lot of dumb character fails that we will, that will happen in our life, especially when we're teenagers. And I can look back at my teenage years and go, man, there's a lot of stuff. I look back and I'm like, I can't believe I did that. One of these happened when I was in eighth grade. And I went to a Christian school for middle school and high school. And so part of going to a Christian school is we had to take Bible classes each year. And so I'm in these Bible classes. And one of the assignments in the Bible class was that you had to do scripture memory. So we had to memorize a verse of the Bible. And we'd have to show up in class and you'd get your notebook paper out. You remember like the wide ruled three ring, like all that kind of thing. You get it out, slap it down on the desk. And you got to write down this verse, write down the reference, and you turn it in. And you're graded based on did you get all the words, the commas, the punctuation, whatever, and all these things and get the reference right. You get your grade. Well, you know what I used to do in eighth grade is I used to cheat on my Bible verse quizzes. How awesome is that? I look back now, I'm like, why didn't I cheat on math? I cheated on the Bible. Like, how bad is that? I don't recommend that at all. And I'm not going to tell you how I did it because some of you are students and you don't need any more tools in your cheat box, all right? But I used to cheat on that. You know, it was a character fail for me as a teenager. You know, we, we look in our lives and there's all these little dumb things we look back and they're like, they're not like life altering, but we're like, I can't believe I did that. For some reason, it's like kids like to steal stuff. I mean, that's just a guy thing. You know, you steal candy, you steal an eraser, you steal a pencil, you do whatever. Like, but we just do dumb character things in, in our lives when we're growing up as kids. 
But here's the thing is like when we get older, nobody wakes up one morning and just says, you know what? I would really like to destroy everything about my life today. That would be awesome. Like we don't wake up and just have this thought out of nowhere that I really want to bring destruction (laughs) into the areas of my life. But what happens is if we stop seeking to live a character-driven life, then we can end up on a path or at a destination that we never intended to go or wanted to go to. Because our character is who we are. Our our character is who we are when nobody else is around. I mean, it's what we look at. It's what we listen to. It's how we talk. It's what we say. It's what we think. It's how we respond. It's all of our actions. I mean, this makes up our character. And when we think about the decisions that we will make in our character, I mean, they, they oftentimes in this path of life, like the decisions that start to take us off, and derail our character, they don't always feel like big things right there in the beginning, or they're that significant. I mean, cheating on that homework assignment, or that Bible verse quiz, doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But it can lead to cheating on that test, or that paper, that can, could ultimately lead to failing a class, having college implications. You know, it's like trying that drug, or looking at porn for that first time, feels kind of innocent, but then it can lead to a life with addictions, that can derail your life. You know, it's like sometimes this happens. I'm sure none of you have ever done this, where we kind of fudge the the numbers on our time card, you know, at work, and we kind of lie about it, like, yeah, I was here for that hour. Absolutely, I was. (laughs) But, you know, we, we do that, but then it can lead to greater levels of dishonesty. It can lead to losing a job and having huge career implications. I see this other one happen so often. With those who are married, especially. Somebody's married, and then they, they start that innocent kind of conversation with that coworker of the opposite sex at work. And that little conversation, those little smiles, end up leading to an affair where they can lose their family. And I know, like, when you think about this whole side, I mean, th- these get pretty heavy. But when you think about how it starts, it's like, that's not really that big of a deal. But the importance of this shows, like, our character matters because our character the actions that we do will ultimately determine the destination of our life and this is why we have a value that says we want to live character driven we don't want to short sell ourselves for the sake of progress we don't want to just do these different things that will compromise our character we're going to live character driven and you know what god cares immensely about our character, about your character. In fact, when you look through the pages of Scripture, I mean, time and time again, character comes into play. And through everybody's life that's found in the Bible, I mean, character is at the core. Because if we lose our character, we can lose everything. And there's a guy in the Bible that we read about named King Solomon. Now, King Solomon was king over the nation of Israel. And in fact, history records him to be the wisest person to ever live on the planet. I mean, just had wisdom from God into life, into relationships, into leading. And and he writes this letter one day, sits down to write this letter to his son. You know, he's writing about wisdom for his son, how to have relationships. How do you lead, son? Like, how do you come up one day and lead this country? Like, what are the boundaries you put in place in your life? Be careful with the people you have around you. I mean, think about the direction of your life. He goes through all these different things, writing to his son, and it's coming out of this heart of a father, like pouring out this wisdom. And some of you may be able to relate to this. I mean, maybe you have kids right now, and you're thinking, man, I really want them to do some things differently than I did. Some of you, you may not even have kids yet, but you're thinking one day when I have my future kids, I'm going to tell them, don't do this because I know how this ends. And you want to pass this on. And so Solomon is writing this letter to his son, helping pass on and pouring out this wisdom to him. And this is this letter we find in the Old Testament. The Bible is called Proverbs. And today I want us for this message, as we think about living a character driven life, to just look at one verse, one verse that Solomon tells his son. And this is found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, Above all else, 
In other words, son, more important than anything else right now, like above all else, like let me add a little bit of urgency here, like listen to what I'm about to say. Above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Get this, he's saying, look, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do, son, everything in your life flows from your heart. Now, when he's starting to write this, I mean, he puts on the urgency to say, son, listen to this, because that's what I'm saying, above all else. But he says this idea of guarding your heart. And when he talks about the heart, he's not talking about your physical heart, like, son, you better really watch your cholesterol and you better get some armor, you know, to protect your heart and do all these different things like that. Um, and No, he's talking about the heart inside, like the conscience, the mind, the source of our emotions. He's saying, look, son, you need to guard your heart. And this word guard, when we look back in the Hebrew language, leads us to this idea of watching over in order to protect. I mean, think about this. Like, it, it's like watch over your heart, son, in order to protect it. And when you think back in this day, they used to have guards that would get up on the, the city walls and they would, they would watch out across the horizon looking for an enemy to come. And they're watching in order to protect the city. Because back in this day, they didn't have, you know, the radars and the satellites to go, oh yeah, they just made a move like 500 miles away. We should better, better get ready, boys. No, they like, oh, he's like 100 yards away. We better get ready right now. So they watch over constantly, being alert, looking for somebody who might try and come and take them out so they're ready to protect. And what he's saying is, son, you got to watch over your heart in order to protect it. Because everything gets its start in your heart. You ever think about this? Everything gets its start in your heart. Jesus would actually talk about this in Matthew 15. If you go and read there, he's talking about out of the heart of a person. This is where lies, murder, lust, stealing, like all these things, they all come out of the heart. When we think about it, everything gets its start in our heart. The bad, but also the good, the faithfulness, the love, the kindness, the generosity. These these things all come out of our heart because everything gets its start in your heart. And that's why Solomon says, look, son, above all else, guard your heart because everything gets its start in your heart. And for us, when we think about our character, all the different attributes that we just listed that can come out of our heart. I mean, these things define and shape our character. And our character comes straight out of our heart. So if we are going to live character-driven lives, we have to guard our heart. And the thing that I want to talk about for the rest of our time today is three ways that we can guard our heart so that we can live character-driven lives. And I want to encourage all of you to just take down some notes. I'm going to give you some questions to think about, some things that you can go back and try and process through later. Because, listen, I, I think that this is one of the most significant things that we can give some of our attention to and some brain space to because the decisions that we make involving our character and guarding our heart will have implications that we will bear for the rest of our life and even the generations after us will bear in our kids and our grandkids. So I want to encourage you to think about this. Write some of these things down as we go through it. But the first thing that we have to do when it comes to guarding our heart is that we must protect it. We must protect it. Back in Solomon's day, when they built a city, they would build a huge wall around the city. They put these massive gates in place. They would put guards up in the walls with guard towers. They would put defensive measures in place so they could be ready for an attack. I mean, they built a boundary all the way around their city in order to protect it. And the idea of guarding our heart and by protecting it is that we establish boundaries in our life that will allow us to protect and to guard our heart. So as we jump into this, let me ask you this. What intentional boundaries have you put in place in your life to protect your heart? What have you intentionally done in your dating life? What have you intentionally done with your finances? What have you intentionally done with your marriage and with your family to protect 
your heart, to establish healthy boundaries that will guard your heart. And you know, there's a little bit of urgency in this. I mean, Solomon says, look, son, above all else, this is what's important. But even Peter who's one of the disciples of Jesus. I mean, this is one of the guys who sat there with Jesus, saw him teach, heard him do, saw him do miracles, saw him go to the cross, saw him rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. I mean, like Peter saw these things and he would write to the early church and these early followers of Jesus. And he would say this to them in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I mean, listen, if we're followers of Jesus, there is nothing more than that Satan would want than to see your life just fall apart, to see you be destroyed, to see your character get rocked. I mean, he's like a roaring lion. And I think about this, like, like Satan's coming after our heart and he's like looking for the holes in the wall. Like, where can he get through? Where are the places that we are not protecting and guarding our heart? And to put up these boundaries, I mean, this is, this is intentional. This is being proactive. So let me give you a few questions to think through. How are you doing at protecting your heart? Number one, are you accountable to someone? I mean, is there somebody in your life that can ask you? I mean, you've given permission to ask you the hard questions. Somebody that you can go to, be honest with, be open with. They'll pray for you. They'll encourage you. They'll walk beside you. Is there somebody that you are accountable to? Second one, this may sound overly simple, but I mean, are you reading and learning the Bible? Because listen to this, in Psalm 119.9, it says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? It says, by living according to your word. In other words, if I want to stay on this path and I want to follow God, I want to live on this path of purity, following him, like, how can I do it? Well, I live by God's word. How do I do that? I got to know it. So often we come into following Jesus, but we don't put in the work to maybe just sit there and read it. And y'all, I get it. Like I was working with some of our students the other day, and we were downloading the Bible version app on their phones, help them try and teach us. And they're like getting the King James version, which is on the these and the thousands, it's like Shakespeare Bible, you know, like, and, and it's like, how, what did I do with this? Thou shalt, thou, thee, blah. Like, they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. Like, that's a big barrier for a lot of people. But maybe it's taking the step to say, you know what, there are some life groups that are Bible study groups that will teach you how to read through the Bible, that will help you get into it. Maybe you need to take that step. Maybe it's getting the YouVersion Bible app. It's finding like an NIV or NLT translation. Those are letters. You can just write those down, NIV, NLT, and go find one of those translations and just read those that are easy to understand using a reading plan, like one verse a day. Because what happens is when we start to read, learn, and apply God's Word in our life, it helps us. Stay on this path of purity because we're living according to God's word. Third question on protecting your heart, and this especially if you're married. Are you protecting your heart and your emotions around those of the opposite sex so they don't lead into an inappropriate relationships? What have you put in place? What are your natural vices? You know, all of us have things that it's like that thing that just gets us every time. Well, what are your natural vices? Sex, money, love, power, attention, success. I mean, like go on, on down the, the list into all these different things. Like what is it? And how can you put some boundaries in place that will help protect your heart when those things come up? And I think the important thing that so often we fail to think about is the need to be proactive in this. Because what oftentimes I see happen, especially being in ministry, and working with so many different people is that, is that we go through life and many people don't think about the boundaries they put in place. And then when they hit hard times, health problems, financial, family crisis, and go on down the list of the hard times that might come up. Then at that point, when the pressure is on, we're looking for what can relieve the pressure. We're looking for that easy out. And if we don't have healthy boundaries in place, we take the easy out and we can forsake our character in that season because we didn't have the boundaries already in place. And there's an important thing to think through. When we talk about boundaries, it's, it's important to distinguish between being legalistic and having healthy boundaries. Some of y'all grew up going to church. You went to church environments where it was just super legalistic. 
I mean, it was like, this is what you wear, this is how you act, this is what you say, this is what you do. And, and it got communicated like this is a scriptural, God-mandated thing that you're to do. And you're like, where's that in the Bible? It's not even there. And it gets pushed on us. But there's a difference between being legalistic and having smart, wise, personal boundaries where we are self-aware where we know where I might screw up here, so I'm going to put a boundary in place. Let me share with you just a couple from my life that have helped me, and maybe they'll help you kind of start thinking through some of these for you. You know, when when my wife and I started dating, uh, we've been married for eight years now, uh, but before we got married, we were dating. On the front end of dating, like first week, we had some intentional conversations around what are the boundaries we're going to put in place. We knew one thing was our physical purity, that we didn't want to have sex in, in, before we were married. So we said, okay, what are we going to do? Well, let's think through it. Like, let's not stay up late at each other's houses because uh, nothing good is probably going to happen at that point. Let's not lie down on a bed or a couch or beside each other and get all curled up because that can just lead down this path that we don't want to go down. So we put some intentional boundaries in place to protect our physical purity. The other thing that we did is we wanted to protect our emotional, like our heart, just our emotions. So we made an intentional decision to say, I'm not going to say I love you until we're engaged. Now, a little bit of backstory on my life, the reason that was a bigger deal for me, and this is all personal stuff for me, y'all, it was I had dated a girl for two and a half years before my wife. And we had, like, it was like the young, like, you know, you're like 18, 19, just, oh, it's all emotion like crazy. And we, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, you know, like all this kind of stuff. (laughs) And um, we just had this, this relationship that was so much emotion. And I came into this one going, okay, I want to do some things different. I don't want my heart emotions just to run away before I'm able, one, to handle it and I'm mature enough. Two, I don't want to give away my I love you to some woman that I'm not going to marry. So that was my personal decision. We made the decision. So that's how I proposed to Kendall. You know what I did? I said, babe, I love you. And then I went, Bam put a ring on it (laughs) you know like that's where we started because we wanted to have some boundaries in our relationship that would protect us physically protect us emotionally you know some other things that I've done in my life one is if I have a beer I have a one and done rule one I gotta watch this figure you know what I'm saying but two is I don't want to lead down a path where I get myself into a situation that I never intended or wanted to go Something else I do for my marriage, some boundaries I put in place to protect it and protect, guard my heart, is that I never get in a car, I never go to dinner, I never go somewhere with a person of the opposite sex, just where it's just us. I don't do it because I want to guard my heart and protect my marriage. And some of these things, I know, like these may seem extreme, especially for some of you, you've never heard somebody like talk about something like that, you're like, that dude is weird. But listen to this, for me, There is too much at stake to not really think through and really put in some boundaries in my heart and in my character. There's too much at stake. Above all else, guard your heart because everything gets its start in your heart. We have to protect it. The second thing that we have to do is direct it. Direct it. You know, we live in a, in a unique area here in the Silicon Valley. And we gather this group of people here that, you know, work in tech and corporate and are really kind of high-strung individuals, you know. And um, we get here, and, and some of y'all have probably done this. I had never thought about this until I was talking to somebody one day, and they were talking about interviewing for a job. And I was like, are you thinking about making a move? They're like, no, no, no. I'm just keeping my skills up. And some of y'all have maybe have done this before, and I was like, that is different welcome to San Jose, you know, and, and I was like, okay, tell me more about that, and it was like talking about just keeping our skills up, everything like that, and I was like, okay, I get this, I get this, you know, and then I see people who also, they go, okay, well, I was working at this company, now I'm moving over to this company, and in, in two years, I'm hoping to like kind of maybe go over here, and, and there's so much attention that we put in to building our resume, you know, like where we went to school, what grades did we have, where jobs we have, can we move over here and get this promotion, so it builds this resume, we, we put so much energy here, But let me ask you this, how much energy have you put into 
your eulogy. You ever think about that? You put so much thought and energy into your resume, but how much do you actually put into your eulogy? Because let me tell you something. At the end of your life, your kids, your parents, your family, when they stand up, they're not going to stand up and go, well, uh, he went to Stanford, and um, he got a job at Apple. Two years later, moved to Facebook. And then he went to some startup, and that lasted about uh, six months. And then he went, like, they're not going to read your resume. You know what they're going to do? They're going to talk about you. They're going to talk about who you are. The way that you loved, the way that you led, the way that you modeled, the way that you cared, the way that you were faithful. Like These are the things that they are going to talk about. And if we're going to direct our heart, we have to start thinking through what is the story that I want to tell and have told about me. I mean, what has God called you to do and what's the story that he wants to tell through your life? And when we start to do this, we start to think about the end. And as we're protecting our heart, now we're directing it towards the end and the destination that we want to get to. I mean, I think about this in my life. Some things that I hope when I get to the end that people will say. One is that I was faithful. That at the end of my life, people will say he was faithful. He was faithful to Jesus. He was faithful to his wife. He was faithful to be there for his kids. For what was given to him, he was faithful. Second thing, loving. That one day my kids will stand up and they'll say, you know what? Dad loved us. He was present. He was there. We never questioned whether his job or we were more important. Because we knew he loved us. You know, I also think about my life at the end. Can't spell. That I want to be able to get to the end and say, God used my life to have influence, to matter. That I went through ministry and I finished strong, that I didn't just fall out after 10 years, but that I got to 70 and I sat there and I was like, man, are we just getting started? Let's go. That throughout my life, God would use me to be able to influence people to say yes to Jesus, to passionately follow him, to move into that relationship. And when I think about these things in my life, I mean, it shapes the decisions that I make today, that I make along this path, because now I'm protecting my heart, but I'm also thinking through what end do I want to have for my life? And when we begin to direct our heart, I mean, we've got to make it personal. Maybe for some of you, it's to start thinking through this. At the end, what do you want the people closest to you to say about you? What do you want your spouse to say? What do you want your kids to say? family members, friends? What are the actual words, the descriptors, the characteristics that you want them to say about you? And what would they, what if they said this or that about your life would absolutely break your heart? Like that you'd be like, that would be the worst thing ever. Because you know what? Your character, listen to this, your character will determine your legacy. Your character will determine your legacy. And your character makes an impression on every person you meet. And your character will directly impact the story that is told about you. And you know one of the things that helps me really make this personal? Is when I sit there and I think about, what if I did have a character failure? Like, what if I completely fell off the bandwagon? And did something to wreck my life? I think about the untold pain and hurt that could be inflicted on those closest to me. Because it's not just our heart that can get all jacked up, it's everyone else around us when we, when we fall off. I think about this, and I, y'all, this happens. I've seen this here at South Bay. I've seen it in ministry and churches where there is character failure in a home, and now you've got kids asking, why, did, why doesn't daddy live here anymore? Why did mommy leave? One of the things for me that I would hate to have my kids ask my wife is, why isn't daddy a pastor anymore? Because I had a character, character failure. I mean, think about this. The path that you're going on, is there anything in your life that could cause you to lose everything you've got? Your spouse, your family, your career, your kids. You know, to think about this, that when we have a character failure, that we could create guilt so deep in our lives that we move into this place where we could never forgive ourselves. 
And you know, I've talked to people who sit there and they're like, I can forgive others, but I can never forgive me for what I did. I think about the lifelong consequences that could happen. The STDs, the unwanted pregnancy, the financial pitfall, the career implications. That could be lifelong consequences that all started with a seemingly insignificant small step off, of my, off the path of my character. Our character matters, and it determines our legacy and the story that will be told about our life. Above all else, above all else, guard your heart. Because everything gets its start in your heart. But you know what happens sometimes intentionally, or we just don't even think about it, is that we fail to protect our heart. We don't have the boundaries up. We don't have them in place. We fail to direct it and be intentional about directing our heart. And you know what happens then? Is then we get this junk that comes up in our life. We have this sin that comes in and covers up our heart. We have that relationship where we, we have now regrets. We have guilt. We get this hurt that comes from other people around us. And you know what happens? Is all of a sudden now our heart is starting to get stained up. And now we have these stains in our heart. We've got this junk that's all inside. And you know what can happen is this becomes almost like raw sewage just sitting somewhere. I mean, it starts to become toxic. It becomes toxic in our life. It starts to sp- spill over and spread to other people around us. It begins to handcuff us, paralyze us, shape our whole way that we see the world, the way that we see ourselves, we see everybody around us, as we start to think through all of this. And we carry this weight around inside of our life. And this is where one of the most important parts for guarding our heart comes in is that we have to clean it. We have to clean it. We have to do some looking inside of our heart and saying, what is inside here? Because if everything gets its start in your heart, what is the thing that you are leaving inside of it? What's the thing that's tucked around the corner? And it's not always like these big, huge things. I mean, maybe it's, it's the speck of pride. Where you're not willing to reach out for help, or you're not willing to ask for help, or, or really listen to people. Maybe it's this blot down here. It's the love for money and success where you're chasing after it more than you are after God. Maybe it's, it's the unforgiveness over here that's really left a stain from the hurt that somebody else caused you. You didn't even ask for this to come on, but it's there, and now it's, it's clogging up your heart, and it's bringing in this dirt and this mess. And this becomes the important part for us to come in and need to clean it. It's not just protect and direct, but it's clean it constantly, evaluating where are we at, asking questions like, is everything okay in my heart? Is there any unconfessed sin, any secret sin, anything that I would be really embarrassed if it came out? Is there anything inside there? Are there any attitudes and relationships that I have that I need to deal with? It's not them, it's me. I need to deal with this in my heart. Asking the questions, how quick am I to admit when I'm wrong and to seek forgiveness? How quick am I to repent? I mean, that's like what the Bible says, this idea of making a turn or a change. It's like, I'm going this way, but I'm making this change. I'm going to repent and go this way now to follow Jesus. How quick am I to do that? when it comes to cleaning my heart. And you know what happens for us so often? Is that we get to this point, and some of you may feel like this is a picture of your heart today. And we get to this point, and this is a really hopeless feeling. Where when we get here, we feel like there's no hope. There's no way this is going to change. Like I'm just like dirty and used up. I mean, there's, there's nothing that I can do. But you know what the great news is? Is that failure is not fatal. That failure is not fatal. And it's the amazing news about the gospel message of Jesus. Is that God would look down on mankind and he would look and he would see all these messed up hearts. All these messed up, jacked up people. And he would look down at them and say, I will make a way for this to be clean. I will send my one, my only son, Jesus, down to come to this earth. You know what? He will live a perfect life, meaning he's never going to sin. He's not going to get all stained up because he's going to go to a cross. 
And he's going to pay the ultimate price and sacrifice on that cross, giving up his life. And the reason that he can pay for everybody else's junk is because he is perfect and he can take that place. And he will pay the payment for sin. Therefore, anybody who turns to Jesus, puts their faith in Jesus, they can be forgiven. They can have hope. They can have peace. They can have a new life. Now they go from heading towards hell and eternity apart from God to now heading towards heaven because this can be clean in Jesus. And there is an immediate, when we turn to Jesus, forgiveness that comes. And then it follows up by the walking and the restoring. And the restoring part can take some time, but there is a restoring that happens as we walk in a relationship with Jesus. And you know, I love what the Apostle Paul, this guy wrote many of the letters in the New Testament of the Bible. He would go around starting churches all over in the very beginning of the early church. And knowing his past, I mean, like this was a guy who used to kill Christians, beat them, put them in jail, tried to destroy the church in the world, but would meet and encounter Jesus. And here he is going from this brokenness, this dirt, this mess, to one day writing to a church saying this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He would say, you know what? The old, yeah, this, this is gone. And there's something new that has come. The new has come, the old is gone, and this is what Jesus wants to do in our lives. Is he wants to bring new. That this old hurts, this pain, this sin, this mess that you're carrying, like, like Jesus came so that this can be gone, to take it away. So it is no more. To give you hope that you don't carry this anymore, but this is now what he's doing in you and through you. Because of going to the cross and we turn to Jesus, we put our faith in him and we start to follow him. And then we start to, above all else, guard our hearts because everything's going to get its start. So we have to put in boundaries to protect it. We have to put in measures to direct it. And then we have to put in measures to make sure that we are cleaning it. Because if we're going to live a character-driven life, it starts smack in the middle of our heart. And it overflows into everything else in our life. You know, when I look at a room like this and I think about this, like each of us here today are on different paths. Some of you today, you're walking down a path for your life. And you're either intentionally walking this path, or maybe you just haven't even been thinking about it. But you're walking on a path where you are flirting with disaster. And you could be going down a path where you're going to derail some things in your life. And today is the day, can be the day that you change that, that you wake up, that you repent, that you turn, that you change ways and change paths to get back focused on following after Jesus. It can mean that you can avoid the pitfalls, the guilt, the shame, the hurt. You can uh, for, not lose everything by turning and changing your path. And today can be the day that when you look back, when you're 70, when you're 80, when you're older, you look back at this day and you say, that was the time. That was a critical, crucial time period in my life that when I made those decisions to put those boundaries in place to really get serious about guarding my heart, like that's the point. I mean, this is the stories where people go, I almost left your mom, but because of these decisions on that day, I'm still married to her 50 years later. These are the decisions when one day kids will grow up and say, my dad was loving and faithful because of that day when he made that decision. These are the decisions that we make right now today. Some of you are right there on the brink of making the wrong call. And I don't want to see you do it because your character matters. But some of you right now, you have this opportunity. Listen, you have this opportunity to proactively think about your life. To start saying, now, this is how I'm going to date. This is how I'm going to do marriage. This is how I'm going to do my finances. This is how I'm going to do my work. This is how I'm going to do school. Like, you have the opportunity to be proactive right now and start thinking, how I'm going to guard my heart. How I'm going to live character-driven so that I don't walk down the paths I've seen other people go down. Wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes and applying it into our life so that we can walk forward in it. And you have the opportunity right now to be wise. And you know what? 
Some of you, you may have never had somebody who sat down with you, poured into you, helped you, but you can be a game changer for the generation to come after you. You can be somebody who says, you know what, I didn't have somebody teach me all this, but I will start learning it today. And when I have kids one day, or if I have kids today, I will ensure and make sure that when they grow up, they walk in a different light, in a different path, avoiding some of the pitfalls that I went through. It's the opportunity for us today. And in just a minute, the band is going to come out and they're going to con- going to play a song for us. And I just have one thing I want to ask you all to do. When you came in today, there was an index card in your chair. If you can all go ahead and grab your index card, just hold on to that. And during this song, here's what I want to ask each of us to do. And this is, this is for you. It's to write down what are two things I need to do to protect my heart. What are two boundaries that I need to put in place? Think through the categories of your life. Dating, marriage, family, work, finances, whatever. Like go down the list. What are two things I can do this week to start to put boundaries in my life? What are two things that I can do to direct it? And what are the two words, what are two sentences that you want people in your eulogy and at the very end to say this about you? And then what are two things I need to clean? What's the sin that's in there that I know has been there that I need to deal with and shed some light on? What's the hurt that maybe somebody else inflicted on me that's really been paralyzing me and clogging up my heart? That I, I, It's time. It's time to not let it plug me anymore and sit here. And listen, these cards are for you. Like, you don't have to turn these in. We don't need to see them. This is purely for you, between you and God, to look at this. And this is what I want to ask you to do, because this will help it sink in, is to take that card and put it somewhere this week where you're going to see it every single day. At least once a day, you're going to look at it. Put it in your car, put it on your dresser, your bathroom mirror, put it in your Bible. I mean, put it somewhere where you're going to see it. And every day, just read over it. And say, God, help me to protect my life here. Help me to direct my heart here. Help me to clean this thing out of my life. This is what I want to ask you to do. And just every day, look at it for this week. Just once a day, pray over it, look at it. And let this begin to be the day when you will say, above all else, I will guard my heart because everything is going to get its start in it. And my character matters. And I will live a life that is character driven. Let me pray for us. God, today, it's kind of a heavy subject as we think about our character, the decisions, the ramifications that they could have, the implications. But God, what is one of the greater things that we can do is to really get intentional and proactive to think about our heart and how we're going to guard it because everything's going to get start from it. The good, the bad one day, the, the decisions that totally train wreck our life and the decisions that lead to the greatest blessings ever will all start in our heart. And it is time that is worth it. And God, I pray that you would give us the strength, the tenacity to just gut check ourselves and to think about the destination for our lives and where we're going. And that this will be the week that we look back on and we say, that's when I made some changes. And God, would you help us to be a people that as we follow you, Jesus, we live character-driven lives. Where we're imperfect, we're going to screw up, but we're going to get back up. And we're going to follow you, Jesus. And I pray for this, for each of us to have that strength. God, I pray for those who are here right now specifically. God, who have something in their life where they're on the brink of falling off their path. They're flirting with disaster right now. God, give them the strength and the boldness to step out and to say, I need help today. And to not wait because the stakes are too high. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.